I would like to invite Samir back on the stage for a fireside chat with our next speaker, Mr. Bharat Shah, uh, on a golden decade for Indian markets. Mr. Shah is a whole time director of ASK Asset and Wealth Management Group. He holds a bachelor's degree in commerce from University of Bombay and a postgraduate diploma in management from IIM Calcutta. He is also a member of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of India and a member of the Institute of Cost and Works Accountants of India. He has been on the board of our company since 2008. He has over 34 years of experience in the field of investment management and overall experience of over 38 years. He has previously worked with Birla Sun Life AMC and Asian Pains. Mr. Shah's guidance is instrumental in driving ASK Asset and Wealth Management's growth and maintaining its strong market position. Welcome, sir. So I'll just do a quick introduction. So, for those of you who haven't met Bharat yet, uh, he's spent over three decades in, in the financial markets, uh, almost two decades at ASK. Uh, all the investment philosophy, the process that you see, uh, the germination of Indian entrepreneur strategy, which quite a few of you guys are invested in, uh, has all come from Bharat. So he has been the person who has seen this strategy, this idea getting germinated. And then of course with the team, the investment team, Sumit, other colleagues, has seen it to the level that it has now become a two, two and a half billion dollar, dollar strategy. That's one of our strategies. Of course, there are other strategies which, which also gets overseen by him. So today's conversation was when, when I spoke with Bharat, I said, okay, how are we going to do this? Uh, you guys have heard about our philosophy. You've, you've heard about uh, how we do our processes. What I wanted Bharat to share with you was his vision, the experience that he comes with. He has seen the India's transformation, very, very important. And one of the few people who has seen India, what it was in the early 90s, has been part of the industry, has seen the evolution, has seen the success that India has seen in the last eight to 10 years, and then of course, where it's now going to go. So I thought it was a, it was a context to provide to you people that uh, there's someone who has seen the whole journey and will be able to share his views, his thoughts, uh, the opportunities and the challenges that he's seen throughout his journey. So I think that will make it an insightful conversation. I think Bharat wants to start with a few initial comments and then we'll have an interactive Q&A kind of a session. Over to you, sir. Yeah, sure. Good afternoon to all the ladies and gentlemen. Six years back, I wrote an article called Golden Decade of India uh, in Economic Times, one of the leading business papers of the country. I got a feedback at that time that maybe it was more polite feedback was that it was a bit ahead of the time. Little less polite feedback was that it was rather presumptuous. I think there was a grain of truth in both of those comments, really speaking. Because I think the things were just beginning to take shape. The seeds were being laid. The picture was far from being anywhere near clear. If I have to write the same <coughs> article today, I'll make one minor change. Golden decade, singular, I'll turn into plural golden decades of India. Really speaking, if we talk about what we all are familiar with as practitioners of investing, uh, as I see the faces for many decades, many of you, including me, <clears throat> we all are familiar that what are the fundamental significant building blocks of value creation. But to reiterate, to my mind, I would say three principal ones. <coughs> One is the growth rate, growth of the, not just top line, but bottom line, and most importantly, cash flow. Second, 
the aspects which make growth endemic again three principal ideas durability of growth predictability of the growth and resilience of that growth to the external business challenges the third aspect i would put is the quality of the growth the character of the growth the moats that the business have the capital efficiency return on capital employed return on equity and all that goes with it now if i apply this to the india situation and the fourth aspect i would say is the valuation or the margin of safety but i think probably somewhere along the way we'll discuss that i suppose so if i focus on three principal blocks for value creation and where india is mirrored today i think in last 10 years india has come a great way in all of this on the growth rate i think we have lifted not just growth rate per se but our capability to achieve growth rate so there is a base and there is a foundation which is very strong today on which to build a sustained uh, superior growth rate because without that growth no real value can be created second and which is rooted into significant reforms which have occurred over last 10 years and very importantly these reforms have been interconnected therefore they have built an ecosystem of their own they are not one off they are not in silos but they are interconnected and therefore it is leading to rising crescendo where these reforms are connected together to build a kind of a virtuous cycle whether it is in the revolution in the payment infrastructure of the country digital payment infrastructure embrace of technology in everything that goes in the country the Im- huge improvement in the physical infrastructure which has been made energy energy transition the greening of the energy and among the most important strides that india has made in that direction starting and building an economic in the manufacturing ecosystem of the country many many other reforms including kick starting genuine entrepreneurial revolution because no great value creation in any country can happen without the entrepreneur ecosystem being very strong and i think uh, it is not just the startup ecosystem which is one of the most vibrant ones in the world today but all forms of entrepreneurship is visible in the way new companies are coming to the markets on an all, almost ongoing basis uh, which is nothing but the proof of the entrepreneurship flourishing and receiving great amount of support so when these reforms if they were to be in silos and not deep and not interconnected it based would have produced an arithmetic outcome but when they are all interconnected and they are built strategically they become a kind of a virtuous cycle and therefore growth has become durable and not short term growth has become predictable and not really an accidental happenstance or a chance and growth has become resilient because important building blocks exist so that even if challenges come by like in last two years uh, we are seeing many parts of the world that conflict with each other and yet india's ecosystem continues to chug along at a much much superior rate compared to the rest of the world and that's again not an accidental outcome it has happened because a lot of things have happened at the backdrop of it and finally the capital efficiency or the character of the growth or the quality of growth first time last year return on equity in india became number 1 in the world this medal always belonged to the america for decades 
American corporate ecosystem has always produced the highest capital efficiency for decades and decades. And therefore, no surprise that American markets have remained at the forefront of great value creation over a long period of time. But for the first time, return on equity of Indian corporate segment has exceeded that of America, and I think it is a great foretelling of a situation which is going to unfold before us over the coming decade, if not decades. The balance sheets have become stronger. Debt equity ratio of the Indian corporate sector pre-COVID, five years back, was 80 units of borrowing to 100 units of net worth. That number today, with a strong growth over this five-year period, has actually come down to half, 40 units of borrowing to 100 units of net worth. ROCs have risen and have touched number one in the world. Return on equity has risen and has become number one in the world. Balance sheets, both of the lenders and borrowers, have never been healthier than ever before in my 35 years of observing equity markets in this country. And finally, and very, very importantly, the great belief, self-belief about the destiny of the businesses and destiny of this country, without which no investment in a business can occur, without which no investment in equities can occur. And I think, therefore, the three vital building blocks all are in place in India today to create a very strong rising crescent of value creation. I'll stop here and we'll, uh, uh, we'll have discussion on the uh, questions. Sure, thanks, Bharat. So look, and I'm, I'm going to be a bit selfish over here because a lot of questions I get from you guys are the questions I'm going to pose to him. Uh, and I think one of the most important one that, that comes through, uh, everyone knows the last 10 years for India have been spectacular. Uh, yeah, but the, under PM Modi's leadership, the political stability that India has, has seen, the demographic dividend that we speak of has all played an important role. I think the challenge, Bharat, is when we speak to global investors and some of them who are sitting over here today, the question that gets asked is, we completely agree that Indian stock market has delivered outsized returns. Uh, I think it's on. It's on. Uh, when, when the current government came to power, the Sensex was about uh, close to 35, 25, 35,000. It's now gone on to about 85,000. So you've seen a great amount of growth. Their question they have is, I'm coming in now, and next 10 years, are we going to see that kind of growth? Am I late to the party? And how do you answer that? Uh, short answer, party has just begun, and I think it is so many more lakes to cover, so much distance to travel, and so many more things to be achieved. And as I said, if I have to write that article again, it will be plural, golden decades of India, not the golden decade. And therefore, I think for the first time in my 35 years of career in investing in this country, I would say future looks remarkably superior to the past. Well, party has just begun, guys, so keep that in mind. It's <laughs> very important. Um, I think that brings us to the next question because that flows in. I, I agree when you are on the ground, you see the buzz, you, you hear, you touch things. And, and I think that's the experience we are trying to give all our investors. And there's a reason why we've got them over here. As a global investor, where emerging markets over the last three years haven't really delivered any returns, if you, if you have to speak, and you obviously know what constituents uh, India in the emerging market, it's, it's been marginal. How do they need to look at India differently from a single country allocation? What do they need to look at? Because the same parameters which are valid for some of the global markets seem to be a little different when it comes to India. So I think your thoughts would be very important there. 
If you recollect over a period of last uh, 10 years or so, whenever we co had conversation, as well as with many of the investors, I've always mentioned that at some stage, India will emerge as an independent asset class of its own and not bundled up together with some Asia, ex Asia, ex Japan, Asia PEC, or some EM kind of a concoction or some kind of a jumbled up uh, terminology like BRICS and all of that. Uh, I, there are three important ideas behind that. There is a size and scale that India possesses, uh, which is unrivaled by many others. B, that size and scale is going to get bigger by a margin. And C, very importantly, it is a scale of capital efficiency. We heard Mr. Lal talking about, uh, uh, you know, having expanded in a period of about eight years by 20 times. And yet, uh, that kind of a business is going to grow three and four times over the next four years' time frame. And therefore, it is the capital efficiency at a scale which is the distinguishing aspect. Let me draw a picture of comparison, and let me take the three biggest uh, markets of the world, uh, America, China, and India. And let me put some comparison metrics of GDP growth rate and the stock market returns in dollar terms in these three markets. I did a comparison some time back, but numbers would be more or less similar then and not very different. If you look at nominal GDP growth rate in dollar terms for America over 30 years, 4%, little less than 4%. China, incredible, 13.5%. India, relatively more modest at about 8.5%. Look at the stock market returns. America, 4% GDP growth rate, reducing almost about 9.5% dollar returns over a 30-year period. For one unit of growth uh, in America, it produced two and a half units of returns, or 5% per annum compounded extra over a 30-year period. China, but before I come to China, let me put India. 8.5% growth for India over this 30-year period, nominal GDP dollar growth rate, and about similar kind of uh, market returns in dollar terms, about 8.5% again, like for like, no premium like America. China, 13.5% GDP growth rate. Unprecedented, unlikely that anywhere in the future similar growth rate would occur in any other country for a 30-year period kind of number because it is huge on a 30-year time frame. The market returns in China, and that's where the rub comes by, less than 1%. That 1% is not accidental. 12% discount on the growth, 0% premium but no discount on India, and 5% premium on America's growth. None of these are accidental happenstances or chances. It is because markets are ruthless arbiters of underlying reality over a long run. And therefore, in the, the quality premium that America commanded, the diehard capitalist system, and more importantly, very efficient capital allocator as a country, has resulted in what America has achieved over this time frame. China, phenomenal growth rate, but at a cost of huge amount of damage to the balance sheet of the country, as well as at very inferior capital efficiency. India did not grow as much as the potential demands of India so far, but at least Indian businesses produce decent capital efficiency while preserving balance sheet during tough time in terms of the policy making within country. On all those scores, India has actually improved by miles today. And that is why I think the growth rate of India will be superior than its past. Capital efficiency is leaps ahead of what it has represented so far. And balance sheets have never been healthier than what they are today. And therefore, 
e even though making this kind of predictions is something i am very very uh, conscious about that forecasting is a mugs game and uh, making those long term forecast is even a bigger mugs game but uh, i if i have to put my neck out i would say in the coming decade or more india in all probability will be number one market in the world in terms of the returns generated and i suspect by some margin because i think both on the growth rate it will create a distance compared to other others more durable one more predictable one and superior quality and therefore even on that score it will uh, create a distance and therefore these emerging market and other conundrum that keeps playing around finally things are falling in place to give a new reality a, a clearer picture well i i agree to a certain extent what you say because uh, as you know based being based out of singapore and been there for last 28 odd years i've actually seen uh, india never really getting a single country allocation pie and uh, it was never on the table just never existed on the table it was an afterthought most of the times and it was all right we'll we'll look at something or oh, we've got exposure to msci india or oh, sorry msci emerging markets and at best if somebody was really bullish then it was etf you know, i'll buy an indian etf and i'll forget about that so i think to to bharat's point uh, india's time has clearly come last 2 to 3 years have been significant uh, we have been able to convince some of you to to look at it and we are hoping that we'll convince all of you at some point of time where those allocations continue to grow significantly another question which we always get um, and as we educate people as we speak we interact with all of you the other question that we get is what keeps you awake we understand the key factors in india we understand where the growth's going to come from yeah we get the demographic dividend but what are the challenges as a global investor you need to be aware and uh, you need the stomach for indian food and you need a stomach for indian stock market as well so i think your thoughts there would be good for indian food you need pellet not stomach <laughs> uh, 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 so to that but on the risk factor well it may be tempting to talk about usual stuff uh, you know oil prices global situation uh, the challenge we have with some of our neighbors which have been long drawn and have not really receded into the background is one would have wished all of them represent difficulties and challenges but none of them i would regard as imponderable or not something that we can't deal with as a country if there is one aspect which i uh which i would still worry about a lot and has considerable impact on whatever judgments uh, uh i would make for the future or i am putting it out in this gathering i would only put one single important issue leadership leadership is the most important issue of the country and i would say leadership is most important in ev almost every context whether of a family of a firm of a society or a country leadership is very vital lot of times i hear that india in any case will grow at some 5 5 and a half 6% irrespective of whoever comes to power i beg to differ uh, god is not given uh, some kind of a benediction to india that it is destined to grow at some 5 and a half 6% or more irrespective of whatever happens or irrespective of policy choices or decisions we make we have come this far and i have no hesitation in saying because of lot of things that we have done in last 10 years in particular not that all the things have happened only in 10 years they there is a history beyond that too but among the most important fundamental changes the character of the changes the depth of the changes and strategic overtones of those changes i would without any hesitation say it has occurred over last 10 years and therefore whether 
I'll just give you one example. Ukraine and Russia, which is still more than two and a half years and the war has not ended. And it is still, it looks like a some miles to go before we see more logic and sense of uh, cutting down this kind of conflict. Ordinarily speaking, any such conflict would have meant a doom for India. And one of the first bogey, the, one of the first bogeys that was raised was on the oil price, uh, which went up and India would have suffered, given the fact that India is almost 85, 90% imported of the hydrocarbon energy that it needs. It would have meant uh, untold amount of uh, 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 challenge, apart from uh, the conflict affecting supply chains and other challenges and difficulties and affecting India's international trade. But the way India has managed these challenges and difficulty without really creating any issues around with the different partners in the world is something which is an example of leadership. Therefore, leadership is one issue that I would worry about. I think purposive, honest, hardworking, visionary leadership is key for a country to define its outcome. And we have one today. If it sustains, I think these outcomes will get bolstered, what I talked about. If there is any challenge to that, uh, if the facts change, we have to revise our opinions. And if that happens, then I may have to revise my opinion. But barring that, really speaking, I do not have any other factors that I would consider as uh, deal off the table. This is one thing which can mean a potential deal off the table, but other than that, usual challenges, usual difficulties, oil prices, conflicts, neighborly challenges, uh, even if I'm putting it in a little friendly overtone, it's more than that, uh, and many other significant issues that the world is confronted with, all of them can be dealt with. But this is vital. Thank you. So look, I have a few more questions, but I think uh, I want to make this a bit more interactive. So let me take a pause. Any questions before I go on to a few more? Uh, when, when I meet you guys, you have a plethora of questions for us. Here's the time to ask those difficult questions. Uh, and get a perspective of the, of the expert who has been seeing these markets for well over 30, 35 years. I think for the benefit of others, Bharat, uh, if you can highlight, we have covered digital infrastructure and technology, but I think the physical infrastructure in which and the size of that opportunity, I think, has not been covered in this forum. So if you can cover that, it will be uh, um, no, an eye No, I talked about it uh, uh, along with the digital public infrastructure. In brief, I said how physical infrastructure has galloped, but let me give some example of that. Our port capacity is expanded by 120% in last 10 years. The, if you look at our road network, something similar has happened in the last 10 years. Ten years back, we had 74 airports in the country. Today, we have 153 airports. Therefore, what this country has built in some 65 years in some of the critical pieces of infrastructure, which has been a bugbear of this country, we have more than replicated it in the last 10 years. Apart from the scale at which it has been done, uh, what has been more important is the character of that infrastructure which has been built. The kind and the quality of those infrastructure pieces which have been put in place are world class. And therefore, that gives you great confidence about where things are headed. In terms of energy, energy transition from the conventional to the greening of energy, even though all the uh, carbon uh, pets and the discussions uh, go on ad infinitum in the world and despite the fact that many of the uh, uh, mainly Europe and America are required to commit to the finance because in order to make this happen while all that has been going on for years and not a dollar has come actually so far but India has not wavered from that greening agenda 
it is actually it has actually embarked upon one of the fastest uh, green energy agendas in the world and in all probability will be doing it ahead of time that we have committed to and it is not merely confined to the green energy in form of solar or wind or hydro or uh, uh, atomic uh, energy at a um, atm kind of smaller reactor level but even on h2 i believe the green hydrogen indian ecosystem on that probably will be number one in the world in next four years time or even before i think full evidence of that would be in offing but among the most important and exciting and the largest h2 projects in the world are being embarked upon in this country which have reached a level of fruition so i think in huge areas uh, the transition is happening uh, on on that point even on real estate uh, which is what amit actually is more deeply concerned with i think at a scale the country is transforming its real estate scenario itself the for physical digital intellectual capital uh, uh, for the first time last year a large research and innovation budget has been committed by government of india is a part of its budgetary exercise in uh, uh, four decades of my observing budgetary exercise in this country for the first time we are seeing refreshing changes of this kind the government is playing a role of catalyst to change the character of the uh, growth which can happen well um gold is like uh, a huge alternative for the households in india and that's for a reason i mean gold is like money uh rupee is like currency it's a credit how will you have and include actually gold in your product shelf in the future that's the first question the second is sorry i couldn't uh, hear uh, the last part properly how will you actually include gold and uh, this type of investments if it's an investment into your product stock okay. in our portfolio gold gold uh in our public market portfolio there is no place for gold and uh, we have zero investment in gold per se but uh, there there are businesses which deal with gold as a raw material india is one of the most exciting jewelry uh, industry traditionally very very strong uh, and it has been uh, like a lender of last resort to many households especially women folk and therefore gold is one of the traditional investments which has always occurred irrespective of the economic conditions and we have some of the best businesses in that area in the country and many more new entrepreneurs are emerging in that area so we have investment which are surrogate variety of uh, that kind then there are lenders which have created an ecosystem out of gold uh, based lending and it is a very strong uh, very very powerful ecosystem which has been built so we have surrogate investments of this kind but uh, gold is a part of our public market portfolio uh, uh, we are not permitted to and we do not have any investment in gold directly as a part of it uh, but you had a second question i thought well that was actually how do you define quality stocks in india well i would if i have to talk about quality uh, i would say quality both of the business and management uh, uh and the quality of both of these is vital quality of balance sheet pnl uh, profit and loss account is important but i would say it's a supportive factor it's not a fundamental catalyst for value creation it it's a hygiene factor which needs to be there to ensure that the quality of the business and quality of management translates into an outcome which is desirable if i talk about quality of management i would think of things like not just vision but also execution hard execution on the ground not just good capital distribution but terrific capital allocation the choices that the management makes in order to build that value over a period of time not merely 
a, a kind of resilience to the challenges, but adaptability, fire in the belly, skin in the game, and ability to transcend, uh, to convert opportunity into outcomes while remaining very ethical and uh, governance prone. Therefore, not merely capability, but also character. These, I would, some total of it is, is a quality of management. Hard to get in uh, fullness in one management, all of the aspects, but healthy enough combination of that is something that is always a focus of uh, when we do our stock selection. The quality of business is relatively easier part to deal with. And it is not merely written on capital employed, uh, but also written on equity, uh, which is aided and abated by the quality of management on the uh, written on capital employed generated by the business. And I think India, actually speaking, if you look at the diversity of choices available in various areas of activity, in across different parts, whether services, manufacturing, industry, agri-based businesses, new age businesses. I would really say even America doesn't have the same diversity of the businesses and choices available uh, that India has. China is much more about manufacturing and industry. America is far more today about technology than it ever has been, and to that extent far more dependent on a relatively limited number of businesses to drive the destiny of that country's growth. Brazil, agree and all of that, but very little of the other opportunities in that country of the scale and size. India represents a unique combination of many, many important businesses across so many areas. And therefore, the diversity of choices available fundamentally is a risk reduction at a market level, systemic risk reduction, that you're not vulnerable and dependent on limited number of businesses to drive your returns and to build genuine diversity in the portfolios rather than being crippled or dependent way too much on a limited number of businesses like we see in South Korea, for example, Samsung will determine the destiny of Cosby Index and the likewise. These, uh, the fundamental depth of the Indian businesses and I mentioned about the entrepreneurship Philip which is given by the government and therefore many more new businesses are springing that even five years back or ten years back we did not see. And therefore, that's where uh, uh, I think uh, the choices are coming by. Therefore, diversity of businesses, strong balance sheets, return on capital employed, return on equity, moats which are built by entrepreneurs because entrepreneurs have great fire in the belly to deal with the challenges and see through the fruition of the businesses to the eventual outcomes you know, without wavering from the challenges or without recoiling from the difficulties. So you had a question. Thank you. So Samir, you mentioned this uh, demographic dividend uh, quite some time, but in order to harvest this demographic dividend, I suppose women need to join the labor force. If I recall, I've seen that it's only 25% of the women who are actually, uh, or the, the participation rate among women is 25%. What regulation or actions is in place for, for this ratio to improve? Well, uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, uh, this is like a balance sheet and profit and loss account. Balance sheet is, is on a day. Profit and loss account is uh, for a period. Uh, I think the progress that we are making is more that flux of a profit and loss account variety. The snapshot that you presented, 25% or so, is a balance sheet date. Uh, so at margin, things are changing rapidly, but it will take a while before what is at a date will become over a period of kind of an outcome that we are seeking. Government incentivization, uh, one of the very significant 
lending programs that government has conjured up over the last uh, eight years or so. It is one of the biggest actually lending programs in the world uh, that government is anywhere in the world is being conducted at a low, low uh, cost of capital and uh, given with minimal fuss uh, to the potential entrepreneurs. The bias of that program is very clearly tilting towards women in order to make them self-employed. And effort of this government is not merely to convert people into employees for a giant machine like a cog in the wheel. Effort of this government is actually to, apart from building those businesses of scale and size like Dixon Technology that we saw earlier before, uh, where a lot of people can be employed, but also to build entrepreneurship and capability so that people build their own businesses. Therefore, at a small, micro, mid-level of the businesses, a lot of incentivization and uh, government focus is very strongly there to build that ecosystem where people become employers rather than being employed or seeking to be employed by others. I think it's a huge mindset uh, uh, that is underway. But issues of this kind are derived in the societal character. How society, family unit, how behavioral patterns have shaped up over a period of time. It takes time before the transition occurs. But society in general is rapidly altering towards uh, uh, getting a meaningful place for uh, women folk to contribute to the economic activity of this country which they so richly deserve and which they, uh, which they are so very strongly capable of. And good evidence of that was in Chess Olympiad uh, which just concluded where India earned the gold medal and women apart from the men uh, were right at the forefront in achieving that. Gary, there's a question. Yes. So many incentives, like uh, there is a concessional stamp duty for properties registered which are in the name of women. So they, they become economic owners of an asset and therefore they don't become vulnerable to the, uh, to the main folk of the house. Uh, also, as I mentioned, the lending programs, concession, uh, bank account uh, opening up, where benefits, uh, uh, India is running one of the largest uh, uh, social benefit programs in the world, entirely done out digitally, some $450 billion of you know, socio-economic benefits are being transferred effortlessly at a stroke of a button with no corruption, no leakage, no uh, leaky kind of a system that uh, <coughs> all uh, you know, such programs are suspect and susceptible to. And um, one of the important conditions for transfer of these benefits is uh, uh, the name of the woman is uh, account holder in that area. So there are many other societal initiatives government is seeking to build this. Yeah, yeah maybe just a broader question on the whole la workforce, labor force, um, there's a lot of criticism still in, in India about the lack of investment in education. I think the percentage of GDP is still the same number as when Modi came to power. Are you concerned about that? Because I look at financial services, I think here in Mumbai, people's jobs being bid up and quite a lot of wage inflation in pockets, clearly not at a, a whole country level. No, absolutely right. I completely agree with you. But as I mentioned to his question, balance sheet is on date or profit and loss account over a period of time. Health, education, and building intellectual capital or innovation ecosystem, all these three are the vital most uh, important social capital issues. Physical infrastructure, physical capital, I think is well on the way. Many of the physical pieces, I think, will get finished at some stage, not too very far off, I think. Road network, for example, probably not too far off, we'll see the fruition and completion of it. Uh, similarly for other infrastructure pieces on the physical arena. But very important social capital 
mainly three, education, health, and intellectual capital, and building R&D talent and innovation capital within. I think these are, uh, government is hugely seized of it. A, you have to find balance sheet to fund this program. Uh, B, you have to, you can make a difference at margin over a period of time. C, the challenges of the balance sheet of the past that you have inherited, the legacy, these issues take some time before you can fully resort. But government is mindful of these, and therefore efforts allocation are directed to in that area. Given the fact that large amounts required will mean only a relatively small basis point increase in the budgetary exercise over a period of time, uh, seemingly. But I think we must also reckon with the fact that uh, last four years have not been very usual. Two years spent in COVID, which put a constraint on challenge uh, on the growth rate across the world. And India then has to find, find resources to deal with that challenge as well. And the last two years of conflict in the world, all of these has meant some amount of limitation. Therefore, India has chosen to build the relatively quicker paying initiatives which will build wealth building capability and income generating capability, which in turn will find resources to fund these programs. But absolutely right, these are vital, and government in its sections and incentivization program is, in my opinion, is very well seized of it. But it's a journey. Thank well, you. that $6,000 is a subsidy being given to every household for uh, health care. And recently, government has also increased the same 6000 additional allocation for those households who can't afford health care, which uh, for senior citizens. So now every household which has a senior citizen gets 10, uh, almost $12,000 worth of health care benefits free and free hospitalization every year. And that's a significant in the health care space. And also I think uh, if you can cover the IITs and the IMs and the number of increase and the... But they are well aware yeah. of it. IITs and IMs are the apostles of uh, the intellectual capital. Yeah. Uh, I'm not trying to claim a brownie point because I'm a product of one of them, but uh, genuinely these are fantastic uh, education institutes of very high degree and quality. But education and building that ecosystem and creating reputation and creating name again takes time because uh, prejudices are not easy to break. It takes time uh, before people start believing uh, the changes of this kind because these changes creeping over a period of time. It's not as if suddenly you see a bridge over a place or a new road over a place, which is easy to see, but these changes take time to build, and therefore that's where we are. Well, looks like the board is telling me that it's only us two standing between a good, delicious lunch and, and us, so uh, don't want to hold you guys any further. Uh, what time we need to get back? 2.15. So, uh, Bharat, thank you very much for your wisdom. Bharat is going to be around, uh, so feel free to interact. He's, he's very much there during lunch, so please use the opportunity to engage with him. Once again, thank you very much for, for, your, for the information, your wisdom, of course, and spending time with us today. India is inviting, and in more ways than one. Uh, I'm not trying to be salesman. Uh, uh, that I leave for Sameer to do. But uh, 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 I genuinely believe we are at the cusp of one of the most dramatic changes. Uh, uh, this country is fundamentally getting transformed and getting rebuilt at a speed that we have never seen before. And with an integrity, with a, with a mindset of building a scale. Because change which is at a small scale doesn't achieve much. Uh, large scale, but with poor capital efficiency also doesn't do much. When you build a scale uh, and a growth rate, but at a quality of the growth being sound, that's where dramatic outcomes happen. I think we are staring at one of those dramatic out outcomes waiting to happen. I wish I were uh, 20 years younger. Uh, that's out of self-interest because uh, my mouth salivates at the wealth creation opportunity in this country. And 20 years more compounding is a phenomenal uh, outcome to look forward to. But 
maybe uh, that my wish of 20 years younger to be uh, is more a wish, I hope. Therefore, if that doesn't happen, I live a little longer enough uh, so that I can get that compounding phase. You're still young, Bharat. Thank you. Thank you.